So in this video, we're going to rework the example of torsion in a circular bar, but we're going to use our formal tensor notation. So if you recall, the shear stress over a cross section of the area of a circular bar in torsion is equal to T, where capital T is the total applied torque R, which is the radial distance from the center over J, which was our polar moment of inertia. So the first thing we need to do is convert this to an XY coordinate system or we could work in cylindrical coordinates, but let's just convert things to an XY coordinate system. Okay, so here's a sketch of our XY coordinate system. And what we wanna do is we need to get a vector quantity of the stress in this kind of coordinate frame. And if we notice here, the stress is always tangent to the circle. So for any circle, the stress is always gonna be tangent. So here's our radius. an angle here, theta. This is the value of x, where we're talking about along the circle. And here's the value of y. And if we look very, very carefully, we can see that this angle here is also theta, right? So the angle that the tangent vector makes uh, with a circle at any point is gonna to equal to this uh, angle right here. So this angle here and this angle here are theta. And so what does that mean? So that means that our tangent vector, for our tangent vector, that I'll call small t with a line over it for tangent, is going to equal the x component of that vector, right, is basically this quantity here, right? And this quantity here is the same as this quantity here. So the x component of that vector is going to equal to y. And I'm putting a minus sign because you see the x component is pointing this way when y is positive. If we went over here to y being negative, so at this location here, our tangent vector would be pointing that way. And so you can see the x component of that vector would be positive. So there's a minus y in the x component of the tangent vector. And likewise, the vertical component of that vector is the projection, right, of this little tangent vector on this axis, which is gonna be related to x. Now, this isn't a good tangent vector because it's, it's not normalized, right? The magnitude of this vector depends upon how far we are for the origin. So we need to normalize it so the magnitude of this vector is one. So we would just divide it by the square root of x squared plus y squared which is also equivalent to r, the radial distance from the origin. So what that means is that our tangent vector is nothing more than y over r and x over r. So what that implies then is that if we wanna represent this shear stress as a stress vector in the xy plane acting over a cross section of the area, that this stress vector, and so what we'd be left with is our common factor of t over j where the x component would be minus y and the y component would be x. So that would be our stress vector. So our stress vector then is going to have this form t over j times minus y and x. So there's shear stress across a plane. Now we're gonna suppose that there's no normal stress acting on this plane because what we saw before was when we twist this bar, when we apply our torque t, so then we apply our torque T and twist this bar, what we observed previously is that the length doesn't change, right? So all we see is the twist. We don't see any change in the distance between these grid lines. So we're sort of hypothesizing then that this stress along the Z direction, the axial direction of twist is zero. So now let's turn this stress vector that we know or we found previously to a stress tensor. And now I'm gonna use our matrix notation and say that if I take the stress tensor, capital T, uh, not to be confused with the torque here, right? So a little bit of confusion of notation here, but I'm gonna put two lines under the stress tensor. And I operate on our normal vector N, that I should get back the stress vector. Now this is the stress vector we get on this surface. So in this case, the normal vector is the one that points out of the page. And so our stress tensor times our normal vector, 0, 0, 1, the one that points out of the page, should give us this result, torque over j minus y and x. And so if we just look at our matrix vector operation, 
what that means is the x component of this equa equation tells us that tau xz should be simply that quantity, shear stress in the yz plane, right? Should be that quantity, and sigma z times one equals zero, so that should be zero. So this number is gonna be zero, this number is known, this number is known, which means that this number and this number is known by symmetry. And so what does that mean for these four quantities here, right? This equation doesn't tell us anything about these four quantities here because they could be any number, but they get multiplied by zero, zero. So this relationship is still satisfied. However, we can hypothesize that these numbers are also going to be zero because these are stresses. These are normal stresses in the xy plane. And if you remember, if there were normal stresses in the xy plane when we twisted, we would expect to see this thing get smushed in some kind of way, right? But we don't. When we look at this thing end on, all we do is we see a rotation, right? There's no obvious compression or anything like that. There's no obvious normal stresses in this plane. So we can kind of hypothesize that those are going to be zeros as well. There's also no apparent shear in the xy plane, again, because when we look at the a cross-section plane, all we see is twist. We would expect to see some kind of shearing motion that these lines would somehow deform otherwise. So I think what that we can hypothesize then pretty safely then is that we now know our stress tensor. And so here is our stress tensor for a bar in torsion. And in this case, the strain tensor, or the infinitesimal strain tensor to be more precise, is just proportional to the stress tensor minus this piece which is related to the trace. But in this case, remember the trace is just the sum of these elements, so it's zero. So in this example, this part goes away, and therefore the infinitesimal strain tensor and the stress tensor are basically the same. There's just this extra factor of 2g. So for consistency with our formulation, one of the important things we have to do is check that our assumed form of this stress tensor is going to satisfy our relationships which came from some of the forces equaling zero at every point in the material. So if you remember in our vector calculus notation we discussed that being the divergence of this stress tensor but written out in component form we can kind of write it in more detailed. So here's the three components uh, x, y, and z of our fundamental equation that says that all the derivatives of this matrix have to equal to zero in the kind of the way we, we derived previously. So let's cross out all the terms that we don't need to worry about. So all our normal stresses are zero, so all these terms with sigma would go away. Our shear stress tau xy and tau yx, which it has to be the same, go away, so I can get rid of those two terms. And so we're left with something that looks like this. And so what we see is that then the following, that tau xz, which is this term right here, and tau xz, which is this term here, that the derivative with respect to z is equal to zero, right? Because there's no z dependence in y. Uh, so we see immediately that that term will also go away. So zero equals zero, so check. And in our z component, we see the derivative with respect to x of this term is also zero. So that goes away. Now tau yz, right, so yz, which is this term right here, and by symmetry that term right here, its derivative with respect to z is also zero, because the derivative of x with respect to z is zero, and the derivative with respect to y is zero. So our fundamental equation, which we write compactly as the divergence of the stress tensor equals to zero, but it's really given at in component form, x, y, z form as the following equation is automatically satisfied by our assumed form of the stress tensor. So, okay, so now what we wanna do is connect this infinitesimal strain tensor to the displacements. So if you recall, this factor up here in the corner was related to this displacements in the following way. So there is this factor of one half and then the derivatives of the displacements the z displacement with respect to x 
and the x displacement with respect to z is equal to this value. And similarly, for this quantity here, we get the following relationship. Now, by observation, so by observation, we saw that there's no displacement in the z direction, right? The grid lines stay equally spaced when I twist and apply pure shear. So what that means is we can sort of hypothesize then that the z displacement w is going to be zero. And so what we're left with is a very easy equation to integrate because we want to say the derivative with respect to z is equal to this, this number here, which has no dependence on z, only the y-coordinate system. So uh, very easy to integrate. So first I can cancel these factors of two, and then I can simply integrate. So this tells me the displacement field uh, in the plane u and v. And now we have to remember that this result here is only good for values of small strain because if we go back to our circle, so if I look at my circle in the xy plane, if I go along a line of y is equal to zero but change my value of x, that means the x displacement, right, so there is zero, so there's no movement in this direction. The vertical displacement, right, is proportional to the distance I go out, so there's a motion upwards. If I go less if I go only halfway out in x, then I have half the motion. If I hold x equals to zero and I go up in y, again, the vertical component is zero because x is zero, so there's no motion this way, and there's only motion in the minus y direction. So again, we have just kind of this circular deformation where the points just kind of rotate around in a circle. But you can see that this value uh, but we can see that this result is only good in the infinitesimal limit, the small strain limit, because the way I've drawn these vectors, if a point really moved from here to here, uh, which right would be a large deformation, uh, clearly the circular shape wouldn't be retained. So this is really only valid in the limit of small strain. And then we also see this dependency on z here, that as we move up the bar, right, there's more and more twist uh, because the uh, angular twist just stacks. Right, so if we look at a point here, right, its motion is greater than a point here simply because the amount of shear strain is just kind of adding up as we move down. So that's why we have this linear dependence on z. But again, this is only a small strain limit because clearly as the points wrap around, we would have to have a little bit more complexity built into our formula here. So that wraps up our uh, tensor view of a bar in torsion. We really didn't learn anything new. We're just trying to make a connection from our more formal tensor formulation to things that we already know.